virtual camp of Company K, 67th New York Infantry, also known as the First Long Island Volunteers. And if you didn't know already, I'll be instructor, uh, Lieutenant William Kent, also known as Max Kenny. In this lesson, we're going to answer the question, what happened when the soldiers got sick? Or, what was medicine like during the American Civil War? If you may recall from our introduction video, uh, when the American Civil War first broke out, the U.S. Army was quite small, uh, only about 16,000 soldiers. However, during the course of the war, eventually 2 million men served in the Northern Armies and 1 million men served in the Southern Armies. And that is a lot of people to look after. And the recruits faced a lot of mortal dangers before they even reached battle. First, these huge numbers of new recruits require the creation of vast training camps the size of small towns in order to equip and train them for battle. But what happens when you crowd a large number of people into a small area and one of them gets sick? Well, then everyone gets sick. And we're not just talking about common colds either. These were diseases that you may not have heard of, such as diphtheria, mumps, rubella, scarlet fever, and whooping cough, all of which were possibly life-threatening, especially measles and smallpox. These diseases would spread through the camps like wildfire, sometimes killing off many a soldier before they even got into battle. Today we have vaccines for most of the diseases that afflicted the common person back in the 1860s. Before you even start school today, you were given vaccines for chickenpox, measles, rubella, which is also called German measles, mumps, whooping cough, and a variety of other diseases which you might not even have heard of, much less have seen. In the 1860s, there was only one vaccine, and that was for a disease that was one of mankind's greatest killers, smallpox. Now, in the 20th century, we've managed to eradicate smallpox, but back then, it ran rampant and killed many a soldier. However, the vaccine that was provided for smallpox at the time was actually rather primitive, not entirely effective, and wasn't available to everyone. That brings us to the topic of immunity. Now, who would you think has a stronger immune system? Someone who grew up in the country or someone who grew up in the city? Well, think about it. If you were exposed to diseases pretty much all the time from once you're born, your immune system is going to get quite a workout. So by the time you grow up, your immune system is much stronger than someone who grew up on a farm who lives a much isolated existence. And well, at that time, the vast majority of Americans lived on farms. So when these men were crowded into these large camps, it was often the country folk who got hit the hardest. Here's another great challenge the soldiers had to face, and that was sanitation. Now all the diseases that I have listed up until this point, these were all transmitted from person to person. We haven't even gotten into the diseases that were a result of bad sanitation. Whether in camp or out on the battlefield, the soldiers faced sanitary conditions that today we would find very shocking. If the soldiers were in established camps, uh, the soldiers would do their business in latrines. And these latrines, that's the, uh, that's the army word for toilets, would just really be big, long, open trenches uh, with benches set up on one side and you would just pretty much do that right open in the public. And since these latrines were out in the open, what would they attract? Insects, specifically flies, that would uh, dance upon all the soldiers' waste uh, and then take a flight, maybe land on your food, and all without the courtesy of uh, wiping their feet. Piles of garbage would attract all sorts of vermin, such as insects and rats. And then in the warmer month, uh, the men had to deal with the mosquitoes. And what they didn't understand at the time was that these mosquitoes would be carrying diseases of their own, such as malaria and yellow fever. Now we come to the topic of hygiene, or your own personal sanitation. A soldier's camp had no plumbing like you take for granted in your homes. Not only did the men rarely wash their hands, they rarely bathed. In the 19th century, uh, even the upper classes would bathe possibly maybe once a week, uh, because indoor plumbing just wasn't very common. Sometimes soldiers would bathe whenever there was an opportunity, 
such as a nearby lake or river. The soldiers wore the same clothes all the time for most of the war. The men not only stank from filthy bodies and uniforms, but were also crawling with lice. Again, if there was time, the men would wash their clothes with soap made from lye. And to get rid of the lice, they would often boil their clothes. There's one more aspect of a soldier's life, whether in camp or out on the march, that might kill him or make his life absolutely miserable, and that's water. Once again, they didn't have filtered and fresh drinking water coming out of faucets. So where did they get their water? Anywhere that they could find it. As we covered in the video on soldiers' rations, the water the soldiers drank may have looked clean, but they still contained plenty of microorganisms, some causing fatal diseases like cholera or typhoid. And nearly everyone in the military suffered from dysentery, which is like a chronic form of diarrhea. I mean, today we might find that a kind of amusing, However, it wasn't for the soldiers back then, because without the medicines to stop it, uh, they lost all of their fluids and died from dehydration. They didn't know it at the time, but when they boiled the water to make their coffee, they were actually saving their own lives, because what does boiling the water do? It sterilizes the water and kills off all of the microorganisms. All right, let's just say that you survived the camps, and then you're going to go out in the march, and you're going to fight. Well, the first thing that you're going to be fighting are the elements. Because the common soldier was exposed to the elements 24-7, 365 days a year. The soldiers suffered under extreme conditions, whether heat, cold, or pouring rain. Many soldiers died from exposure with the diseases they caused, such as heat stroke, hypothermia, or pneumonia. Okay, congratulations. Okay, you managed to survive the march through horrendous conditions, and you get into battle and you are shot. What happens now? Well, if you survived, there would be an assistant surgeon stationed close to the front line that would swiftly treat the wounded by staunching the bleeding, applying initial bandages, giving whiskey, which was used as a temporary anesthetic, uh, directing stretcher bearers and the walking wounded back, and he would also be assisted by a medical orderly who carried a large hospital knapsack containing additional instruments, dressings, and medicines. The wounded that would either be carried back or managed to walk under their own power would go back to hospitals. And when I mean hospitals in that way, I mean the doctors would try to find any sort of space that they could use, and that included private homes, churches, even barns. Only well after the battle were more organized camps established nearby the battle sites and the soldiers would eventually be sent to large permanent hospitals uh, along the east coast such as in Washington or Philadelphia. Now let's talk a little about the people who are going to be treating you. Okay, today uh, doctors are held in extremely high regard. That wasn't the case in the 19th century. Back in those days many people who claimed to be doctors didn't have any medical training at all, at least not the kind of medical training that we know today. And there weren't that many medical schools in existence. There were no rigorous standards like we have today in order to evaluate the competency of doctors. So it wouldn't surprise you that the common person in the 19th century didn't really hold doctors in a lot of high regard, as many of them were often called quacks, or uh, sometimes the soldiers would even call them butchers. The militaries on both sides were so desperate for doctors, uh, they weren't particularly choosy on abilities, much as the same way as they were with recruiting soldiers. And doctors, like everyone else in the military, had to travel light to keep up with the soldiers. There were horse-drawn ambulances for transporting wounded and supply wagons for medicine and equipment. The regiment's medical inventory included chests of instruments containing amputating knives, saws, forceps, catheters, lancets, needles, syringes, splints, dental instruments, tourniquets, bandages, adhesive plaster, needles, and silk thread for ligatures. When the wounded arrived at the hospitals, they were separated according to the severity of their wounds. This procedure is called triage, a medical procedure that's still used today. The lightly wounded would typically only be bandaged and sometimes even sent back into the fighting. If you were mortally wounded, meaning that your wounds were going to be fatal. To ease the pain of the dying soldiers, uh, they were administered opium. 
which is a powerful narcotic drug, but more about that later. Examples of mortal wounds would include strikes to the chest or the abdomen, because back in those days, uh, they didn't have the knowledge uh, nor the tools in order for operating on these parts of the human anatomy. However, if you fall into the category that could be saved by surgery, then you were taken to the operating table. If you were hit in one of your extremities, uh, such as your, your hand, arm, legs, or feet, uh, the doctors would result to the most common form of surgery in the day, and that was called amputation. The removal of limbs accounted to about 75% of all surgeries during the Civil War. So why was amputation so common? Today's bullets have metal casings, meaning that while it's still not fun to get shot, the bullet flies so fast and gets so hot, it literally sterilizes itself. When it hits a target, it creates a small, clean hole. Back during the Civil War, soldiers used mini balls that were made of soft lead with no casings. When fired, the bullet travels at a slower speed and did not get hot enough to be sterile, yet hot enough to soften. So when these mini balls struck your limbs, it would flatten out and smash everything in its path, including your bones. Now these would cause horrendous fractures, compound fractures that even today are very difficult to set. Next to every operating table, you would see the grisly sight of a pile of bloody amputated limbs covered in flies. As dreadful all this surgery is, there was one small mercy, anesthetic. Fortunately, right before the Civil War, a surgical anesthetic was invented called chloroform, which spared the patient from feeling any pain. There was also a very powerful painkiller or narcotic available known as opium, which comes from the seed of a poppy flower. From opium, very powerful and very dangerous drugs are derived, including morphine, laudanum, and heroin. Overuse of these medicines during the Civil War caused a wave of drug addiction afterwards, afflicting the veterans, that was often called soldier's disease. Okay, now let's just say that you survived the amputation. Well, you were still seven times safer fighting through the Battle of Gettysburg than you were from surviving an amputation. So why was the death rate so high? Well, the answer to that is very simple. And here we circle back to why was it much safer for the soldiers to drink coffee or tea rather than just straight up drinking water? That's because what do you do when you're making coffee or tea? You boil the water. And what does boiling the water do? It sterilizes. That's, it gets so hot that it kills off all the bacteria and germs and viruses living in the water that you might not be able to see, but can still kill you. In the 1860s, absolutely nothing was sterilized. Not the hospitals, not the wounds, not even the medical instruments and supplies were sterilized. Worst of all, the doctors didn't even wash their hands. They would work for hours upon hours with dirty hands and dirty instruments on the wounded. They would work for hours wiping their dirty hands and instruments over their bloody aprons. Surgeons would probe the holes made by bullets with their own dirty fingers and contaminate sutures with their saliva. Unfortunately, the American Civil War took place just before a great leap forward in medicine. And that was the adoption of something called germ theory. Now what does germ theory mean? Simply that microorganisms such as bacteria and viruses cause specific diseases. For all of you in the 21st century, that's just common knowledge. I mean, especially now, you always make sure to wash your hands and to uh, wash any wounds with soap and water. You also make certain that surfaces are clean, especially if you're preparing food, much less surgery. Doctors, in fact, nobody did any of that back in the 1860s. Okay, back then, uh, the prevailing theory was called the miasma theory. Now, what does that mean? Basically, that there was something in the air that made people sick, although they couldn't quite pinpoint exactly what that was. They did know enough, however, to separate sick people from the healthy people, because they knew that putting them in close proximity of each other somehow transmitted diseases. So under the miasma theory, what do they do? So they decide to clean the air, which means lots and lots of ventilation. And we're not just talking about ventilating rooms for lots of fresh air. We're also talking about ventilating the human body, which could be quite graphic at times. Doctors would often prescribe medicines that would make you 
either vomit, sweat, urinate, or purge your bowels. As for cleanliness, scientists did see that there was a relationship between cleanliness and disease. Again, they couldn't quite figure out what that was. However, they started using a chemical called carbolic acid that you can think of as an ancestor of Lysol, which was often used to clean medical facilities. And when they did so, they noticed a significant improvement. However, they didn't know why that was. Now, microscopes had already been around for several hundred years, so scientists were aware of these tiny organisms all around us, but they had not yet linked these microorganisms to disease. Now, what happens when a wound gets dirty? It causes an infection. And what do infections produce? Pus. Back then, pus was often seen to be part of the healing process. In fact, they even called it laudable pus. And they would take pus from the wound of one soldier and actually take it and apply it to the wounds of other soldiers, simply transmitting the disease. Pretty disgusting. There were two types of infections that were particularly gruesome and painful. One was septicemia, which, is, which was an infection of the blood. The other was called gangrene. I won't even dare to even show you photographs of gangrene. However, this is when your flesh literally dies and rots off the bone. You have to remember, there was no such thing as antibiotics. There wasn't any penicillin to treat any of these diseases. One of the tragedies of the Civil War was that these doctors literally worked themselves to death in order to try to save these men. But in many ways, they actually made the situation worse, simply for lack of knowledge. Only after the Civil War ended in 1865 did such important scientists such as Louis Pasteur, Joseph Lister, and Robert Koch finally make that crucial connection, but it was far too late for our soldiers. Very few medicines in a doctor's inventory did much good in order to heal a patient. Many of these medicines were based on home remedies passed over the generations, sometimes even centuries. And these were based on the use of certain plants, leaves, herbs, uh, that, well, to varying degree, might actually help treat some of the symptoms of a patient, but rarely cured. However, the doctors were not entirely unarmed. Two of the most potent medicines that they did have in their medicine cabinet, opium, either in the form of morphine or laudanum for treating pain, quinine, which comes from the bark of a South American tree and was used for treating malaria, a disease caused by mosquitoes. Now this might sound crazy, the doctors used arsenic, belladonna, digitalis, hemlock, and even strychnine, which as you know are poisons but they can be useful in just the right dosage as painkillers, sedatives, laxatives, and treating fevers. There was one treatment in the time that even back in their day they had to discontinue using, and that was mercury, also called quicksilver. We all know now that mercury is highly toxic and can cause madness. The exceptional challenges of the American Civil War led to many innovations in the field of medicine some of which still exist today. For the first time in our history, the U.S. Congress approved the employment of female nurses for general hospitals, and eventually 3,200 female nurses served during the Civil War. Dorothea Lynn Dix as, was given the post of Superintendent of Female Nurses of the Union Army. And one of the grislier industries that boomed during the war was the production of artificial limbs for the survivors of all those amputations. Well, students, we certainly hope that you enjoyed and uh, learned something from this video. Uh, what happened when the soldiers got sick? Civil War medicine. Well, now we've come to the question and answer session. And you just fire away with your questions and we will answer them the best that we can. So until then, this is Lieutenant William Kent, Max Kenny, of Company K, 67th New York Infantry, 1st Long Island Volunteers signing off.